group here. So um, let's just start. So Stacey Francis, welcome to Karen's Corner. It's great to be here today. And I'm excited to talk about finances, especially now because um, for many people, it's, it's the number one topic in addition to health um, that's on your mind. Yeah, for sure. So um, stay, just so people know, Stacy and I have known each other now for 10, 11 years or so. At um, least a decade. At yes, least a decade. At least a decade. Um, and she is an amazing financial advisor, runs a uh, fee-only financial firm based out of, um, where is your office? So we're I, down, I yeah, we're right down near the Wall Street area, right by the bull. And so every time, every day I walk to work, I see the bull and it again reminds me about, you know, investing and thinking long term and because yeah. that's what the bull is all about. Exactly, exactly. So, um, so I'm super excited to have you on today to be talking about this topic because, as you said, everybody's really has concerns. They're wondering yeah. what all these different programs are um, as the stock market changes around. Like, I, I get alerts every day of what's moving, and it's all very overwhelming. So, I really wanted to bring some light to to the topic. Um, yep. And we talked about a few questions. So. I'll just dive right in um, to the first one, which do you think we are in a recession? And if not, do you think one's coming? Uh, so it's interesting because there are some people that um, have announced that we are in a recession. Um, typically recession, recessions are called after the fact. You can't really know you're in a recession until you look back at the data. Um, but you know, I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised if we are. Um, what's interesting is that if you are in your 80s, you've already lived through 10 recessions. If you're in your 60s, you've lived through eight recession. If, if you're in your 40s, like myself, you've lived through three recessions. So while um, recessions are, are serious, um, it's really important to know that it's a healthy part of the economy. Um, I would actually be more worried if we didn't have a pullback at one time because it means that the market would be overvalued and overinflated. And the way I think about it, um, you know, yesterday was about as rainy a day as you could get. Um, we had this huge storm, as many of you might have remembered. And, you know, it's not the nicest day, right? But the flowers and the trees are very happy. And it's the same thing mm -hmm. with the recession. Um, you can only have an expansion, a boom uh, for so long. And then eventually you, you do it as part of the natural ha healthy ecosystem of the economy, just as it is with uh, farming. And I grew up, we grew all of our own food. And so for me, I look at weather very differently. The sun was very, very important, but the days where it rained were even more important. And so that's the he healthy equilibrium that we also need to look at with the market. Yeah, absolutely. I think we were on, what was it, a 10 year increase, right? Since it was, around... it was one of, um, you know, we were living through one of the greatest expansions that we've um, ever had in history. And people were calling for a recession um, actually years and years ago. Um, I, I remember hearing, um, you know, wibblings about recessions uh, six or seven years ago. So the talk is not new. It's just what we're dealing with right now with the pandemic has firmly launched us into a recession. Now, what's interesting about this um, situation is that it's a, it's a going into this situation, our economy was very strong and very healthy. All the indicators, majority of them were phenomenally robust. And, and that is very positive. It means that as we come out of this, as we rebound, um, we're hoping that it's going to be a, um, a, a more shallow dip and that we'll be able to come out of this much stronger. Um, but there are a lot of things that you want to think about as an investor to make sure that you're continuing to, to make good decisions, whether we're in a recession or, or we're not. Yeah. I've been hearing a lot of things and me being in the housing market, we are actually, the last recession was kind of caused by housing, right? It was the, the subprime mortgages and things like that. And now like we actually are, went into this with a lack of inventory. 
back then there was too much inventory. So very different, different things going on here. So let's talk about the market and, you know, what happens when the feds drop the rates and all of the programs, what, like, how do you, how do you start to direct some of your clients? So this is, uh, this is probably one of the most uh, difficult times, particularly for our clients. The majority of our clients are not experienced investors. Um, we work with a lot of women who their husband has passed away, they've gone through a divorce, and he was primarily the, the person who held that role for investing. So even though she might be in her 40s, 50s, 60s, or in 70s and beyond, um, her investing experience is usually pretty limited. And so it means that in a market like we're dealing with right now, um, it can be very frightening, but I think it can be frightening for everyone. Let's mm -hmm. just be, let's just yeah. be honest. Um, we're seeing more volatility and more ups and downs than we've really seen in history. We've had um, new records for single dip point declines in one day. We've had new records for single point, um, you know, gains in one day too. And it, it makes me think um, that I'm on the, a, a roller coaster, and I don't know if anyone's gone on the roller coaster out in Coney Island, the cyclone. Um, I got off there and, and I thought that my neck had been whipped off. It feels yeah. a lot of, of the same way with the market. Um, and, and I think the challenge is, is that sometimes we're our worst enemy. What's most important about getting through this market is making sure that you have the right allocation. And that's just the fancy way of saying, do you have the right amount of stocks versus bonds. And um, many people going into what we're dealing with right now were over allocated to stocks because they've seen the stock portion of their portfolio mm -hmm. increase by leaps and bounds. I mean, we, we had 30% returns in our portfolios last year in the stock piece. And mm -hmm. unless you are diligent and working with an advisor that's bringing you back in balance, that ideal mixture of stocks and bonds, just because of the nature of how much stocks have grown over the last 10 years, you are over allocated. So some people are looking at their portfolio and they're seeing huge losses because 90% are in stocks and 10% are in bonds. And if that's you, do you make the change now or do you wait till things settle? Mm -hmm. If you're not in the right allocation, I have to say, I'm sorry, you're going to need to wait a little bit longer until things settle and things recover more so. Because if you move from that 90% stocks to 10% bonds to something that might be more appropriate for you, like 60% stocks and 40% bonds, you're going to take a, a massive, massive dip in the value of your portfolio that you're never going to be able to have the opportunity to recover from. Mm -hmm. um, so now is a great opportunity for you to see what is my ideal allocation and put a plan in place for once things recover to be able to make those tweaks and get you to that, I write, that right ideal long-term allocation. So speaking about that, you've got people who are of all different age brackets, right? So somebody in their 30s has a very different long-term plan than somebody in their 60s and 70s. So yes. let's speak to briefly to the person in their 30s or, or 40s, you know, long-term planning here. What are you, yeah. what would you be suggesting? So if you're in your, um, your 30s and 40s, you're going to most likely, based on your, your uh, age and number of years yet to work, probably about 70% in stocks, 30% in bonds, unless you can't stomach risk and you need a lot, lot less. And that's okay. Um, mm -hmm. But typically you see much more, you know, 70, 30 split. Once you get into your 50s and 60s, you start to see more 60% bonds, 40% stocks. And as you get older into your 70s and 80s, when you're actually living on your portfolio, you're taking a paycheck from your portfolio. That might come down and be the inverse. It might be 40% stocks and 60% bonds. Um, it's really based on how long does this portfolio need to last for you? What rate of return do you need to make sure that it's still there for you at age 95? Mm -hmm. And what's even more important, and Karen, it's I think the most important thing is what mixture is going to allow you to sleep at night? Because what we're seeing right now is we're seeing some investors 
have what we call crisis fatigue, jump off the deep end, move to cash, and absolutely devastate, devastate their long-term financial picture. That's the worst thing that you can do. And, you know, making sure that you stick through this tough time is key. And then at the end, make sure you have that right allocation if for some reason you're realizing you have the wrong one right now. Yeah. Oof. So working with somebody instead of just like jumping on the stock market going down, let's buy now, stock market went up, let's sell. Like yeah. it, there's, there is a lot of strategy. So, yeah. so speaking of which, um, most people, like you said, are very stressed and they're watching all their money that they've saved over the years kind of dwindle. What, I mean, <laughs> yeah. how do you- I'm right there with you. I'm right there yeah. with you, Karen. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what kind of what kind of practices are you are you um, kind of recommending to help us ride this out? Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of people have uh, what's been scientifically uh, identified as what's called crisis fatigue, um, and you are bombarded with uh, very frightening, scary, anxiety-provoking messages um, every day throughout the day. And um, there's a point where we no longer can think clearly. Um, when it particularly comes to the stock market, um, when you see a drop in the value of your portfolio, the part of the brain where that's processed is actually in the same part of the brain where our pre prehistoric ancestors thought about, do I, you know, do I flee the lion or mm -hmm. do I stay? Um, so it's a very prehistoric part of your brain called the amygdala. And the challenge is, is that when the amygdala is, is triggered, that fight or flight, um, syndrome, your prefrontal cortex, this is where all of our smart logical thinking is, gets shut off. It's like a highway that all of a sudden that highway of thoughts going back and talking back and forth stops and you've got a traffic jam. And if individuals watch CNBC, read the news, are constantly looking at their portfolio every single day, studies have shown that your amygdala takes over and your prefrontal logical thinking gets shut off. And so what we need to do, Karen, is we have to kind of trick ourselves. And I do this myself. So I have to be tuned into the news Monday through Friday. And it is very hard. But come six o'clock, I am not allowed to touch the news. Anything with news other than I found a couple good news mm -hmm. channels where it's all good news. And yeah. so I only watch that. <laughs> and then on the weekend, same thing. On the weekend, starting Friday at six o'clock, all the way until Monday at 8 a.m. I am not letting myself watch any news at all. Mm -hmm. And essentially what I'm doing is I'm protecting myself. And that's what we need to do too, is we need to protect ourselves because you can only have so much trauma. And people have also seen that if you're watching the market, you're watching your portfolio, um, we're seeing PSD, you know, oh, pro okay. post traumatic stress disorder, blah, blah, blah. but um, you know, essentially, you know, we're seeing that same ongoing trauma. And so protecting yourself is really important and knowing that, okay, I will get my news once a day. I will log in to see my account maybe once a week um, and putting those structures in place so that you're not being re-traumatized on a daily basis. Yeah. And for people who have advisors, um, it's almost maybe better to not look at it and just yeah. I mean, to be honest, that somebody else has it under control. <laughs> and that's what you want. You want to work with someone you trust. And if yeah. you do find that you're watching your portfolio uh, and you do have an advisor, it might be a good opportunity to have a conversation with mm -hmm. them because it could be maybe that you don't trust them yet. Um, mm -hmm. It could be a lot of things, but it's a great it's a great thing to talk about with your advisor to figure yeah. out why am I doing this? Do I need to be doing this? Yeah. It's the same thing with me where people are saying, Oh my God, is my va the value of my house gone down? And obviously the financial, you know, the stock market is very different, but it doesn't really matter unless you have to sell <laughs> or unless you have to yeah. buy. <laughs> yeah. Right? Like we're yeah. saying like, we don't know what the discounts will be when we're, you know, out of this, but unless you're actually going to be selling, it doesn't really matter, you know, selling yeah. in the next 
three to five years where you're going to have comps and things to support the price and the value. So. You know, Karen, you so hit the nail on the head because it's so true with real estate. Unless you're selling, it doesn't really matter. And it's the same thing with the portfolio. Unless you need to liquidate your entire portfolio for something, mm -hmm. yeah. you don't really have to worry about it. Even right. if you're living on your portfolio, typically, I mean, we have anywhere from four to five years of, of, of bonds that we can use before we would ever have to touch anything that's been going down. So right. you have a great, um, a really, really good view. Really yeah. good view. Well, thank you. Uh, I can't liquidate my asset quite as quite as easily. Um, so let's talk a little bit about these programs. We've got, yes. we've got the, 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 the mortgages, you've got the, uh, the payroll protection, you've got the disaster, you know, emergencies. There's so many. I've been calling people that I know, like my accountant and trying to figure out like what I qualify for. Can you just shed some okay. light? So let me, I'll, I'll do kind of a two second spiel on each. And um, I invite anyone listening to reach out to me um, and I can walk you through more information. Um, with the mortgages, essentially what they're doing is that it does not hurt your credit. You can um, put your payments on hold. You do need to contact your bank before you do this. And what they'll do is they'll take whatever amount that you're not paying and they just tack it on the end of end of the loan. And again, the good news is, is that this doesn't hurt your credit score in any way. Um, I've had people say, I'm fully employed. I am comfortable with my job security. I have an emergency fund and I have no credit card debt. Should I still take advantage of this? My answer to you is no, you probably shouldn't take advantage of it. But if you can't check all of those things off, meaning that you're not as concerned comfortable about your job long term, maybe you have some credit card debt that'd be good paying down, or you don't have a fully stocked emergency fund, which is three to six months of living expenses, then it might be a good opportunity to take that mortgage payment you normally would have made and sock it away um, to either pay down debt or, or put it in an emergency fund. Mm -hmm. There's also a lot um, out there regarding uh, for businesses. And I just did a presentation on this and, and I spent over an hour focusing all the different pieces of these programs. But I'll talk about the Paycheck Protection Program first. Um, what's very special about this program is that nearly everyone is eligible. It's one of the first times that there's been a, a program available for uh, business owners who own a business like mine, Francis Financial Wealth Management, mm -hmm. but they've extended it also to nonprofits. They've extended it to individuals who are 1099s, consultants. Um, you know, there's a lot of opportunity that we haven't seen in the past. And so if you're unsure, reach out to your accountant. You can reach out to me as well. But mm -hmm. most likely, most likely you are eligible. And they give you a quote unquote loan that's uh, worth essentially two and a half times the cost of your payroll. And when I say payroll, it's not only uh, salary, it's also any benefits like health insurance you might be paying, other insurance costs, your state and local taxes that you're paying on that, um, as well as any you know, retirement benefits that you're giving to your employees. And that number may come out to be 250,000 that you're getting and they will forgive it. They will forgive it if the proceeds are used to pay your employees. So 75% has to be going towards paying employees and then 25% can be going towards other things like your mortgage, utilities, things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. There's another program, the Emergency Disaster Loan. Um, that is, a, it can be a larger loan. Um, only $10,000 of it is forgivable. But what's special about that $10,000 grant is it's meant to be given to you within three days. So it's meant to be a fast, quick and dirty in your pocket. And so some people, what they're doing is they're just applying for $10,000 under that emergency disaster, not using the full amount that you can go to. Um, the one thing to know is that you can't use that $10,000 for the same expenses that you're claiming if you do the paycheck protection program. Mm -hmm. um, so again, you'll want to work with your accountant. Um, time is of the essence because there's a few banks already, Karen, that have mm -hmm. said that they are not um, available to be able to give out any more loans that they fit their um, quota. So that's yeah. something to know. And then also, I just saw in the chat coming up a question about unemployment. Yeah. And um, unemployment is really important for everyone to know too, that if you 
are, if you've been let go, if you've been furloughed, if you are a 1099, if you're a part of the gig economy and um, you are not receiving an income, then mm -hmm. you need to be applying for unemployment ASAP. Um, the call volume is pretty significant. You fill out online, but then you have to get someone face to face, or, or ear to ear to yeah. talk a little bit about that. Um, but know that people are getting through. They are, yeah. it is possible. It is possible. <laughs> um, yeah. And you just want to make sure that it's retroactive to the date where you stopped receiving that income. And I can share with you, Karen, there's a wonderful chart that was released by New York State of who is considered unemployed and who isn't qualified. And it's the most beautiful chart and understandable. Mm -hmm. And really what that means is pretty much everyone, mm -hmm. pretty much everyone is somewhere getting a click yes. The people who don't get it are people who can work from home and are being paid. Mm -hmm. um, so that's pretty much everyone else has that opportunity. And you get $600 extra a week. So that's an additional $2,400 a month on top. Um, so make sure that you're using that, that benefit as well. Yeah. So let me ask about that because a lot of, um, of one of my friends is on from Massachusetts and she's a real estate broker. That's a lot of my kind of contacts. You know, let's, I had a closing two weeks ago. I haven't, and I'm, I'm an S corp. So the money will get paid directly to my corporation and then I will pull from that. So do I qualify for unemployment since I have that money coming in? That is one of my last, you know, paychecks, if you will. Yep. Do I qualify? So most likely you sure do. And what you're going to do is when you talk with them on the phone, say, what date am I quote unquote unemployed. So it could be the date, the day after you get that large check. It could be that, or it could be a different date, but you'll want mm -hmm. to just make sure that whatever date you're using, because what's wonderful about that date, even if this was three weeks ago, let's say it was three weeks ago, you get unemployment retroactive back to that. So that's why it's really important to make sure that you get that benefit. And the other piece of unemployment is that the benefits have been extended much longer. So the majority of the individuals who are on unemployment are not going to, and I'm knocking on wood here, mm -hmm. um, are not going to exhaust the benefits because they really truly have been extended. So you do want to make sure you get those dollars as, as, you know, going back to when that first date is. But your question is just, when is that first date? Yeah. But I'll send you that chart and okay. the chart no, makes it really good. helpful. Um, really, really helpful. It was really nicely done. Really That's nicely good. done. Now, what are the, what are the cons of applying for all of these things? Like I know in terms of the mortgage, I was actually on a call today, I think with somebody from Citizens Bank and I don't know if he was making a statement about just his bank or in general, but he mentioned that like, it's basically a 90 day thing. And then on the fourth month, you have to pay all four months, which the average person is not gonna have four months worth of mortgage, it, you know, at that point. So that could really hurt people and it can impact any, loans you go, you know, you apply for later on. So mortgages. So like, what are you seeing? Like we've got the immediate in my pocket yeah. now, but what's the, what could happen down the road that people need to be thinking about? So with, with all of these programs, you're going to want to talk to, um, so with the mortgage, you want to talk to your bank and understand how they're treating this. If they just back it on the back end, or if they're going to require a, um, payment in four months, um, mm -hmm. you know, the, the Paycheck Protection Program, uh, the negative on that is if you don't use the money your way, the way you're supposed to, and then you have to pay the loan back. And there's mm -hmm. also interest. Now, granted, the interest is at 1%. Yeah. But, um, but, you know, there's a lot of uh, money out there right now that you can gain access to. Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't mean that you don't need to be smart about your money. Now, more than ever, whether you have a, a very stable job or you've been let go is the time to go through your budget. And I know that I went through um, all of my credit card statements mm -hmm. and for the whole year and highlighted things. Um, I've copied, I've, I've, I've stopped a lot of things. I was still paying for my gym membership, even though it's not open. 
right? <laughs> so, um, you know, things like that, we need to do that. And, and it was really insightful for me to see what my spending is. And then I compared it to this time last year. And it was really uh, surprising in the sense of how much my spending has gone down recently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that is such a gift to see that I can be happy and healthy and all these other great things without having to spend as much. I'm, I'm spending a third, a third of what I spent at the same time a year ago. So everyone should be taking a real uh, hard look at their spending, of course, trying to reduce it. Um, that's smart for everyone. And looking at your overall financial picture and making sure that you're trying to do the best you can. Now, knowing what we're all going through, the one thing I do want to ask everyone who's listening is to just give yourself a little bit of forgiveness. I think every single person right now is, is feeling, gosh, I, I wish that I had saved a little bit more in my emergency fund, or I wish that um, I hadn't uh, bought that vacation home or, or you know, had that really big trip last year where I could have put that money away for a rainy day. Mm -hmm. um, it is what it is. It is what it is. And, yeah. you know, many of us are feeling that way and no one is alone. And so what we do is we pick ourselves up by our bootstraps. You know, this being in the real mm -hmm. estate industry, there's so mm -hmm. much out of your control. And this is something that is truly out of a lot of people's control. So what we want to mm -hmm. do is we want to control what we can, and that is getting clear about our spending, doing the best that we can to reduce it and make good decisions going forward with managing our portfolios and having that money work in the market still for us and, mm -hmm. you know, start to put in some plans in place so that once we are back on our feet, you can start to maybe pay down credit card debt, put an emergency fund in place, beef up your retirement. Yeah. And you, you have a, an amazing nonprofit, um, Savvy Ladies. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so you can see I'm smiling. Um, I know. <laughs> yeah, Savvy Ladies is a, it's a love letter to my grandmother. She was one of my most special people in my life. And um, she, unfortunately, was in a, a really bad marriage. And she ended up staying because of money. And she shared that with me before she passed away. And it was just a very eye-opening um, sad thing to hear. And I just don't want any women to ever find themselves feeling backed into a marriage or a job or whatever situation because of money. And so we've increased our programming during this time by 500%. And we just uh, created a partnership with the Financial Planning Association to add a few additional hundred, um, a few hundred extra volunteers to our helpline. Savvy Ladies is the only place that you can go uh, to get one-on-one -on -one support from a certified financial planner. They are great people like myself. We really care and we really want to make uh, a difference and help people, particularly during this time. So if you go to SavvyLadies.org, S-A-V-V-Y, Ladies.org, um, it's all free of charge. There's no... Um, we're not owned by a big company. It's a true 501c3. And um, you'll be able to see that we have webinars nearly every day on every financial topic you could ever imagine. But then most importantly, most importantly, we have hundreds of volunteers that are there to support you and be able to work one-on-one -on -one with a financial planner because I feel that there are so many great articles, books, webinars out there. Um, but there's still the question of what does this mean for me? And we've been getting a lot of questions about um, the PPP, pro, you know, Paycheck Protection Program, unemployment. Um, you know, I just got laid off. Do I run up my credit cards or do I try and pay them off? Do I take that? You can now take $100,000 from your retirement plan without having to pay a penalty. Um, you can take a hundred thousand dollar loan from your 401k as well. It used to only be 50. So there are all these great options, but it's still the question of should should I do that? Or yeah. is that gonna potentially hurt me too much down the line? Yeah. So yeah. please do use that resource. Um, you know, I think our biggest complaint is that there are a lot of people that are still shell-shocked, and so they're not quite reaching out as much as we want them to. Yeah. And so we have again hundreds of volunteers that are waiting that really want to help. Yeah. Wow. Well, no, I've, I've known you, like I said, for 10, 11 years, and I've been to your galas and just very, 
it's incredible. It's incredible work that you do um, and that you are doing. So that's amazing. 500%. I did not know that. So, and are these very people, busy? <laughs> are these are these only in New York or this is nationwide you've got? This? So we are really blessed and we actually just received uh, an emergency grant from the Foundation of Financial Planning because we're one of the only organizations that has a national reach. Um, we have always been online. We also have live events, but 95% um, of our programming is online because the um, people who benefit from this are across you know, all 50, yeah. uh, one of our, you know, our, our states. And so yeah. it's a really important resource for individuals to be able to benefit from that. That's awesome. And uh, I got, I got your newsletter, I think it was yesterday or today with the lineup of what, of what you've got going on at, at a Francis Financial, what uh, you've got some pretty interesting things and people that you're talking to, you want to share that with us? Yeah, so um, we have been doing a lot of work, um, you know, really trying to get out there with education. So every Monday at 8 a.m. we have uh, a market recap and um, real real getting into the numbers without having that technical speak and without the anxiety provoking, um, you know, red and loud noises that you might see on some of those TV shows. Uh -huh. um, so that's really important. We've also been doing a lot of work with the media. We have an article coming out um, on CNBC and Kiplinger's. Um, and, you know, it's really important. It's really powerful to let everyone know that, you know, investing and in finances that they're actually not rocket science a lot of gurus would love you to believe that um, but it's not and um, the more that you learn um, the more comfortable you'll be and I, I liken it to riding a bike I remember the first time I jumped on a bike and it was one of the scariest moments of my entire life but now I jump on a bike and I you know you don't you don't even think about it. It's very natural. And, and it's you the do same. triathlons now. Oh, I do, I do. But, <laughs> you know, uh, minor but, things. Uh, riding minor things. <laughs> um, but for most of us, you know, jumping on a bike or, you know, getting behind the wheel of a car, um, yeah. it's just very natural for us. And it's the same exact thing with investing in finance. Because I will tell you that I was, Karen, I was one of the girls who never raised her hand in math. And oh. I was always very intimidated about numbers. And my, what I tell people is if I can do this, trust me, you can. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So a little yeah. bit of, just a little bit of learning. I took a class on um, options and I was like, oh, like it was fascinating. It was a three day class and I learned, so I have yet to do anything with it. But like, I think now in these times, like, can you give us some other resources that people might be able to go to, to get some, I'm a beginner. I, you know, just need a little bit yeah. of advice. Maybe I've got some extra money, you know, yep. that I can be putting in the market. What would you, what are some resources? Yeah, so uh, one of my favorites in addition to SavvyLadies.org is um, Jean Chatsky owns Daily Worth. Um, it's a great resource. She also has a wonderful podcast um, that she goes live with, and it's a great resource, um, particularly for, you know, kind of the beginning to, to get started with investing. Um, you know, there's a great book that I love uh, called Smart Women Finish Rich, and it's an oldie but goodie. Uh, it was written by David Bach. Um, you know, I, I love it because it's uh, just a very well put together, smart approach to getting smart about your finances. Um, and then there's another one that I like too, and, and part of it is has a really good name. It's called Prince Charming Isn't Coming. Um, and um, killing my I, dreams. I know, I know. And I, I think one of the biggest challenges uh, that we as women will face and sometimes face is the way we're we're raised is that, you know, a, a man is going to save us. And even if we try not to believe that sometimes, you know, I, I just watched um, a Cinderella movie with my daughter last night. And I was like, oh my gosh, we really need to look at our, our movie options other than this, because it's all about a man, you know, saving her. And, um, you know, the good news is, is that she's already investing. She's 11 and she, her investment performance is outperforming her 14, 14 year old um, brother. So I'm pretty darn happy <laughs> about that. Um, and she wants to be a computer programmer when she, when she grows up. But, oh, um, wow. you know, <laughs> those are some great resources. And what I would say again is, 
you know, just as you go to the gym for your financial, you know, for your, your personal health, mm -hmm. it's really important to have this uh, while you're going to the gym or you're taking a walk, listening to some, some podcasts to get some of the fundamentals down for your, you know, your, your financial health too. Yeah. Um, it's really important to have both of them. But what I would say is that you don't need to listen to Federal Reserve notes or some of the more technical pieces, the fundamentals of finance of, you know, your allocation of, you know, pay yourself first of putting money away. Mm -hmm. That's really the most important, you know, living on a, on a living on your paycheck, spending less than your paycheck. The, you know, they're just yeah. very basic. It doesn't sound very exciting, yeah. but those are the things that mm -hmm. when you look at individuals of who's ready for retirement at 65 and who's not, the people who are, are the ones who have done some of these very simple things that yeah. have put them ahead. Because, you know, studies have shown day traders, for example, people who try to time the market, typically underperform the market by over 6%. Mm -hmm. So that will make you feel better too, that again, yeah. market timing um, for most people, for most people, the vast majority doesn't work. So this isn't rocket science. You can totally do it. Totally yeah. do it. And if you need any support, reach out to Savvy Ladies. Um, and if you are looking for an advisor, we're happy to talk to you. But if we don't, we aren't a good fit. We have a great questionnaire um, mm -hmm. that gives you the right questions to ask an advisor because for mm -hmm. most people, um, it's not something they've done before. And I feel like it can be very intimidating. So being armed with, you know, here are my questions I know I need to ask is, yeah. is very, very comforting. For sure. Um, as a former client, I can agree with that. Are there any questions from our attendees? We have a few. Unfortunately, we weren't able to get out to Facebook, but we'll get that out shortly. Um, if there aren't any questions, is there anything else you would like to add to end? Any I other would just advice? say, I, yeah, I love that you're doing this. This is really really phenomenal. And um, I think the biggest piece of advice, and it's actually not about the finances, mm -hmm. um, but I would say even more important is that your personal health mm -hmm. is just as important, if not more so than your financial health. And so now are times that are really important um, to be able to take that time and um, get out there. And, you know, I'm working out in my apartment and, um, you know, having, we have a personal trainer that uh, goes live every Thursday at 5.30. I'm happy to send the information out. Anyone can join. That's but awesome. that's really important because we have a little bit more time yet until this is all over. And it's yeah. hard to make good decisions if you're not in the right headspace yeah. as well. I always, my, my, my coach says, you've got to take your meds. It's your meditation, your exercise, your diet, and your sleep. Yes. After that, then everything should fall into place, assuming you've got the right advisors, but I think it starts with those things. Um, we, we got one question. I, can you see it about the mortgage payment deferral situation? Yeah, so the, this is um, the mortgage payment d deferral. The question was if it just gets tacked on the end or... Um, they, you had mentioned that some lenders are requiring you if you've deferred for three months. When it comes to fourth month, that fourth month you owe the the back payments. Um, so what we're seeing is we're seeing different lenders approach this in a in um, different capacities. So mm -hmm. before you're doing anything, you need to get on the phone with Mr. Cooper, Wells Fargo, Chase, wherever your loan is. And I think what's really important too is that you may have done your loan through Chase and then it was sold somewhere else. So even though you closed with Chase, it could be held by someone else. So you need to look at your most recent mortgage statement and to where your check is being sent, that where that money is being sent. And you need to ask them versus who you might have originally closed with, you know, five or six or 10 years from there. Yeah. Um, and, and really see what their program is and what it means. Um, the other thing to know is that, um, you know, the, there is an opportunity to refinance. However, there is a little bit of a myth and misconception, and I see you're smiling because you know about this, mm -hmm. that while rates are so low, we've actually seen um, interest rates rise. Mortgage and that, 
Mor right. Sorry, mortgage yeah. rates <laughs> rise, even though interest rates have gone down. And it yeah. can be very confusing, but what's ended up happening is that a lot of the mortgage lenders are increasing those mortgage interest rates to make up for what they deem as additional risk, additional risk of um, because of the different mortgage programs out there. So I know that I'm in the process of uh, closing on a house up in Vermont and um, our rate is not what I had hoped it to be. Mm -hmm. And not yeah. definitely yeah. not what I had hoped it to be because we are in that window after the mortgage relief was passed and that's when they raised all the rates. And they've also made the um, closing process uh, many of the, the banks have much stricter requirements than they did even two months ago. So something I'm, I'm starting to see, um, uh, one of our clients, their buyer just got denied by Wells Fargo two days ago, whereas they would have been approved two months ago. And so now they're you know ready to close and they don't have a lender. So of course we're dealing with that, but... Yeah. Um, you know, this is someone that would have been approved two months ago. Yeah, we're um, I, again. The call that I was just on was with uh, an attorney and and uh, an appraisal and appraiser and a banker. And uh, the, the 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 at least for anybody who's trading real estate, having those clauses, you know, the funding clause, not just like the contingency, like do I qualify, but can the bank actually finance this loan? And, you know, we're seeing more and more banks, like they, they don't have the funds left. Like they're just like, we're at capacity. Like, yeah. and they're assuming that they're not going to be getting as much money in because of these more, you know, deferral programs. So, yeah, but you know what, I think from that standpoint, and I'm just going to put a small plug in what we're seeing from a real estate standpoint is so much pent up demand. And, you know, and honestly, the longer that we're in this, we think that like people will get more and more frustrated with their current living situation. They might not be able to afford their current living situation. So, yeah. you know, we could be seeing a major spike in, like, at least from what I'm reading and, and hearing is they're expecting more like a V, like sharp down, sharp up, as, at least in the, in the real estate market, because, yeah. because of just the lack of inventory overall. And I think there will be a lot of shifting, you know? Yeah. Thankfully, it's interesting. Completely unrelated topic, but we expect the same thing. Yeah. Um, so we're seeing in China, divorce rates plummeted during the shelter in place and quarantines, uh -huh. and now is skyrocketing. Yeah. Um, and I think we, we do a lot of work for you know individuals going through divorce mm -hmm. and helping them with the finances, yeah. um, in addition to our, our other work. But um, we're going to see that too. We're going to see that here too. Pent up demand of the courts are closed. Um, yeah. But also, I mean, I love my husband. He's, <laughs> he, we've been together more than 20 years. He's like the best father. You know, as far as husbands goes, he's like a nine, 9.5. That's pretty out of 10. That's pretty darn good. Yeah. Um, but there have been times I wanted to wring his neck as yeah. well. Yeah. You know, and you know, now, now you're living like literally you can't get away from <laughs> right. you just can't yeah. get away so yeah. yeah yeah I think we'll see a lot of a lot of opportunities for for businesses once we are once the courts open once once we're allowed to show apartments again like um yeah, yeah. you know what it's, oh, it's a shift right it's just it's a, a shift, shift. and you know someone people. someone I really really respect said to me you know what you need to do is just always look for the opportunity. Mm -hmm. It may be hard to, to, to realize what it is, but every situation has some type of opportunity and yeah. um, an easy opportunity for all of us right now is just to try and help other people. Yeah. And the more that yeah. you can help other people, however that might, might it be baking cookies for your doorman or, um, you know, a friend of mine is a, a shut-in. She can't really leave her apartment. So making sure she has food. Um, I think, I think there's some amazing opportunities right now. Yeah. Too. What's our saying? What's, what's the BNI way? Givers gain, right? Givers gain. Yeah. <laughs> and I have to say it feels, it, it feels, it feels now whenever I'm a little bit down, I try to mm -hmm. think about what can I do to make myself feel better. And, um, you know, so I might, you know, text my mother-in-law and say, hey, do you want to do family feud with the kids? Or, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it just feels, um, it feels good. 
So, yeah. And, but thank you for doing this. And this is part of your giving yeah. back, Karen. Exactly. I know that a lot of work goes into this and a lot of scheduling. And so yeah. um, I really commend you for, for putting these things together. Thank you. And thank you for participating and to our attendees. We hope, I hope you got a lot out of this. I don't see yep. any more questions. So okay. we're going Good to, to say see goodbye. You. Well, stay safe, stay healthy, stay home, and I'll yes. see you in person soon. I, I know, and I'll give you a big hug, yeah. but for now, it'll be virtual hug and air kisses. Exactly. <laughs> high five, virtual high five, right? <laughs> All right. Have All right. a good, good one, to see everybody, you. and thank you again.